The theremin was shrieking so loudly in Nick's brain he thought his head would explode like an asteroid hitting the earth, sending thousands of reptilian scales flying all over the firmament. That seemed like a fitting resolution to his torment, one he almost hoped for, except for one driving impetus, the search for Dolores. Nick managed to make it to the lake, avoiding contact with anyone, since it was late at night. Allegedly, this was where authorities had initially found her, as a cold corpse washed up on the shore. But then she disappeared again, apparently walking or rolling right out of the morgue, reborn as a zombie mermaid. Out in the street, Hotsey emerges slowly from a manhole, concealing Chumpy within the creamy confines of her luscious cleavage. He's never felt safer or happier. Unfortunately, Neon Nick, who was standing guard at the front door of the sweet shop, spots her as she sticks her head out and looks around, with Chumpy's little head poking out from between her bountiful bosoms. As soon as he sees her, he whistles inside for the attention of Louis the Lemon and Graffiti George, who are sitting at the counter, just about to share a banana split. Hey guys, go tell the boss Chumpy and the dame are out here. Hurry. Climbing back, she commanded. Reluctantly, Johnny complied. Helen climbed back with him, forcibly positioned him on his back, mounted him, pulled his Bermuda shorts down, slipped out of her own cut-off jeans, stuck the magnum in his mouth, cocked the piece, and rode him with animalistic urgency. Johnny's meek protests were muffled by the cold, hard steel bumping against his tonsils, and as Helen, drenched in her own sweat, which mingled with the dried blood and tears, began to find her rhythm, she threatened, Come before I do and I'll blow your head off. Gluella inspired me, because she was an artist. I mean, she didn't just dance, she created. Like one time I remember her coming out wearing nothing but a string of blue roses. Then she took them off and made a bed of roses, as she called it, and she rolled around naked in these blue rose petals and a blue spotlight, and it drove the crowd so nuts, and one time they stormed the stage, so the bouncer had a savor from being eaten alive. Another time she came out covered in blue whipped cream or cake frosting or something and an oily, muscle-bound dude licked it off her till she was naked. It drove me nuts. She was a genius. She stood on tiptoe and kissed me with her tongue deep in my mouth as she backed me up and into the bed. She sat on top of me and began ripping the buttons from my shirt and massaging my chest as she kissed my neck and her breasts rubbed up against me and I didn't want to touch her, but did anyway. Her thighs, her hips, her breasts were seen to be coming from everywhere. I kissed her throat and mouth and eyes and cute little ears and her long, thick hair fell on my face and she laughed and I remember a drowning sensation just before all went dark. I awoke late the next morning after the best sleep I'd had in ages. Man, I felt so virile and alive. I jumped out of bed with a feeling of self-esteem and life affirmation I rarely experienced at all, and never this early in the day. I jiggled Tina to wake up, but she wouldn't budge. I kept dancing around as I got dressed, singing to myself. The rain had cleared up and sunshine poured into the little messy room. I went over to Tina and jiggled her again. She was either in a deep, deep sleep or... I felt her cold skin and then her wrist, which had no pulse. <laughs>